The destruction of the Raider clans in 2289 reinforced the gains made when the Minutemen won their war against the Gunners in the previous year. The Minutemen made a bold statement to the Wasteland by winning victories in these conflicts. The Commonwealth was now a sovereign nation with a powerful military and was not to be trifled with. Seeing that the immediate threats to the Commonwealth were now past, High Elder Maxon decided to remove the bulk of the Brotherhood forces in the Commonwealth. They left aboard the Pridwin to travel back to the Citadel. The Brotherhood would implement the Yeoman concept there and would annex the capital wasteland as their own territory. With a signed defensive pact in place, the Brotherhood felt secure in leaving only a small force of paladins and locally recruited Yeoman to man a series of forts in the Commonwealth. With the Yeoman helping to keep the peace, the Minutemen once again demobilized a large portion of their manpower and turned them into reservists. Free from internal perils and protected from external threats by the increasingly powerful Minutemen, the Commonwealth now had a chance to flourish. Agricultural settlements sprung up in the countryside to feed city dwellers. More and more immigrants arrived to take advantage of the protection afforded to them by a powerful military and set up thriving farms. Formerly empty factories were being refurbished and reopened. Newly manufactured goods were being produced in quantities large enough to export to other parts of North America. Old neighborhoods in Boston were being rehabilitated for occupation by industrial and construction workers. Trade networks began to be set up, bringing raw materials into the Commonwealth and exporting finished goods. But building this new nation required not just willing hands but raw materials. Lumber in particular was needed to shore up subway tunnels, build new walls, and provide the framework for new housing. This commodity was becoming more and more scarce as loggers had to go further and further afield to find fresh tree stands to cut. The lands beyond the borders of the Commonwealth were still as untamed as ever, and the cost of hiring mercenaries to protect the loggers and guard the work sites was proving to be too high. Far to the north of the Commonwealth there was a solution readily available. An island with vast forests that could provide all the lumber that the Commonwealth could ever need. In 2288, the sole survivor had traveled north and negotiated a delicate truce between the children of Atom, the harbormen, and the synths of Arcadia. The truce allowed all three groups to survive without worrying about aggression from the other groups. As the sole survivor left the island, he got the leaders of the three factions to meet on a regular basis to defuse any tension between them. Now the only threats that existed were the super mutants, wild animals, and trappers that inhabited the forests. The truce allowed all the groups to prosper. More synths came north to live in Arcadia. The children of Atom could worship at their holy sites without disturbance, and former residents of the island began to return and reclaim their homesteads. Fog condensers were manufactured in the Commonwealth and sent north to stake out new areas to settle in. Commonwealth settlers established the Echo Lake Lumber Mill as a settlement. The lumber yard was refurbished and started to turn out high-quality lumber. Seeing the prosperity and growth of these groups, the half-mad trappers of the island retreated farther into the dark forests and the southern part of the island. Just as in the Commonwealth, the super mutants of the island began to disappear. The Harbour Grand Hotel was the last site to be abandoned by the super mutants. By late June of 2289 they were all gone. Nobody knew where they had gone. Enterprising sea captains from the Commonwealth traveled north and brought back barges loaded with fresh lumber for sale to construction companies in the Commonwealth. Seeing this opportunity, lumber companies formed and hired newly arrived immigrants for the hard work of clearing the timber stands of the north. Hunters traveled north to bring back hides and meat from the exotic animals of the island. Maple trees were harvested for their syrup and this was bottled for resale in the wasteland. 
The volume of raw materials flowing from the island to the Commonwealth was not insignificant, and neither was the net migration from the Commonwealth to the island. By July of 2289 the number of Commonwealth citizens on the island outnumbered the local harbormen causing friction. Former island residents would sometimes come back to find loggers clearing their homesteads and living in their homes. Disputes would sometimes be settled by who had the most firepower. The settlement around the Echo Lake Lumber Mill had grown enough that they decided to send an envoy to the Commonwealth Congress to present a petition for admission into the Commonwealth. A representative from Far Harbor Town also went south to oppose the annexation. She argued that the island was its own region and that the Commonwealth had no legal right to annex territory from others. As August arrived and the last raider tribes in the Commonwealth were being crushed, the Commonwealth Congress took up the question of annexation. Representatives from the Boston area favored annexation as it would provide them with the resources needed to continue rebuilding the city. Western farm settlements opposed annexation. They argued that the Commonwealth had no right to take over land that was clearly not theirs. In addition they felt that expansion out west into unclaimed lands was a far better option. The arguments continued through the hot weeks of late August. The tempers in the room sometimes becoming hotter than the stiflingly hot summer weather. President Hancock offered up a compromise to the western settlements. In exchange for their support, the Minutemen would build a fort in the western part of the Commonwealth and refurbish the roads leading to western Massachusetts to encourage settlement out west. This political move worked, and by a vote of 32 to 10, the annexation of the Echo Lake Lumber Settlement was approved. On September 19, 2289 the newly appointed territorial governor, Jonathan Chamberlain, proclaimed Echo Lake Lumber Mill to be the territorial capital for Far Harbor. The Commonwealth had its first settlement in Far Harbor. It would not be the last. The creation of a Commonwealth settlement on the island did not go unnoticed by the other parties of the island. The harbormen were unhappy that the Commonwealth now had a formal presence on the island. They expected Minutemen patrols and tax collectors to follow. The Acadia synths became worried that more humans would mean more anti-synth prejudice or even worse, the attention of the Brotherhood of Steel. The ones that took the news worst were the Children of Atom. To the Children of Atom, the entire island was a sacred site, second only to Megaton in importance. They only tolerated the harbormen due to the pact made between the sole survivor and High Confessor Tectus. The clear cutting of so many stands of trees on the island disturbed the children of Atom. As did the hunting of so many of the island's unique animals. They felt that the newcomers were damaging their holy land and that they would soon be crowded out by all the new settlers. The new settlements at Vault 118 and the National Park Visitors Center petitioned and joined the Commonwealth in early 2290. Tensions began to mount as loggers and settlers ran into the children of Atom more and more often. Starting in mid-2289 and continuing into 2290, the amount of fog covering the island began to diminish. Some like old Longfellow said that this was a natural weather pattern and that sometimes the fog went away. However, some of the children of Atom blamed the newcomers for this. They were sure that Atom was displeased with them and was withdrawing her favor. High Confessor Tectus met with Captain Avery, Dima, and Governor Chamberlain to defuse tensions but conflict began to escalate. The worst incident came on October 12 when a logging crew from Echo Lake Lumber dug a drainage ditch to drain Atom Spring, a holy site on the island, and then tried to cut down all the trees in the area. A group of children of Atom Zealots led by Grand Zealot Richter, caught the loggers doing this and massacred them on the spot. Mediation did not work this time. The children of Atom were incensed at the disrespect for their religion. Commonwealth citizens wanted revenge for the massacre. Both Dima and Captain Avery criticized the Commonwealth for allowing its citizens to do whatever they pleased. Back in the nucleus, Grand Zealot Richter met in private with High Confessor Tectus. The particulars of the meeting are not known but the Grand Zealot left the meeting noticeably angry. High Confessor Tectus was found dead in his room on the most holy day of the year, October 23rd. He had apparently passed away from natural causes during the night. The rank and file of the children of Atom took this as a sign. Grand Zealot Richter proclaimed that Tectus had been called to serve Atom. Five days of mourning followed. 
after which the Grand Zealot was elevated to the position of High Confessor. In an unexpected move, he combined the offices of Grand Zealot and High Confessor to become the Grand Confessor. He could now wield complete power among the children of Atom on the island. Richter began by increasing the ranks of the Zealots. Now every child of Atom was expected to learn how to use weapons and to defend the faith against unbelievers. He also sent emissaries to other children of Atom chapters in the wasteland to encourage them to Go move to the island. And bring glorious division. He then sent word to Acadia in early November. He was severing the cooperation pact with the Synths. He charged that Dima had abused their trust and betrayed the children of Atom and that therefore they would no longer trust Synths. Lastly he sent word to both Captain Avery and Territorial Governor Chamberlain, stating that the truce that existed between them and the children of Atom was now over and that any future intrusions onto their land would be dealt with severely. The extremely cold winter of 2290 reduced the number of clashes but as soon as spring arrived in 2291 the incidents began again. Loggers would harass pilgrims at worship, zealots would set up temporary toll stops on the trails. Governor Chamberlain mobilized the Far Harbor Minutemen and they began to patrol the trails between the settlements. Clashes between children of Atom Zealots and Minutemen patrols began to occur and sometimes led to violence. At the same time, Alan Lee in the town of Far Harbor began agitating for the town to join the Commonwealth. Lee saw this as the perfect opportunity to finally rid the island of the children of Atom. Other townsfolk such as Mariner, Brooks, and Captain Avery, opposed annexation. On March 29 the town held a vote and by a slim margin voted to remain independent. Alan Lee was not dissuaded and kept trying to force the issue in the coming months. An incident finally pushed the tense situation on the island over the edge. On April 2, a large force of children of Atom Zealots appeared at the Echo Lake Lumber settlement. They declared that Atom had proclaimed that the western half of the island now belonged to the children of Atom exclusively. The Commonwealth settlers had to vacate the settlement immediately. Failure to do so would result in an attack. The settlers did not reply and the Minutemen garrison dug in for the expected assault. The attack commenced at midnight. Using heavy caliber radium rifles and gamma pistols, the zealots launched wave after wave of attacks against the defenses. Only a desperate last minute charge by chainsaw wielding loggers saved the settlement from being overrun. A relief column sent from the National Visitors Center met a series of roadblocks on the road to Echo Lake and had to turn back. Finally after the third day without progress, a relief force was sent by boat and landed at Barney's Bait and Tackle. They broke the siege and relieved the settlement. The zealots scattered, but loomed in the forest around the settlement just out of range, threatening to resume their siege. The senior Minutemen officer realized that even with the reinforcements that they could not hold the position and made the tough call to evacuate the settlement. The troops, settlers, and loggers were loaded onto the cramped boats and sailed back east to the visitors' center settlement. Unaffiliated settlements like Dalton's Farm and Eagle Cove Tannery were also attacked and overrun. The locals had to flee east to the visitors' center settlement for protection. Some farmers were allowed to stay on the condition that they converted to the Church of Atom and provided food to the children of Atom. Governor Chamberlain radioed a desperate plea for help to the Commonwealth. This was picked up by the Civilian Intelligence Agency. Deep inside the switchboard, the information was reviewed by analysts and by Fahrenheit, the head of the agency. She then prepared a report for President Hancock. News of the disaster was already spreading. The debacle of losing the territorial capital to religious extremists was resonating in the streets of Diamond City, Good Neighbor, and Bunker Hill. Some began to question what the Commonwealth was doing in a land so far away. After studying the reports, President Hancock realized that he had to quickly send troops up north to rescue the situation. But now, he faced a political dilemma. The armed forces of the Commonwealth, known by most as the Minutemen, had been reorganized after the Raider War. Support and specialist units continued to operate as normally. But only half of the armed forces were active duty soldiers. 
the other half were put into reserve status or became settlement defense forces. He could send the active duty units north to battle the religious extremists, but he would have to ask Congress for the funds to activate the reserves to man the defenses back home in the Commonwealth. Doing this would be a huge financial burden. It would also call into question the annexation of territory in Far Harbor and his decision-making ability. In addition, sending hundreds of combat troops north might look like a full-on invasion to the local population. He was desperately hoping that he could persuade them to peacefully join the Commonwealth and add more settlements on the island. But Hancock, ever the crafty politician, engineered a refined solution. He would send two of the Minutemen scout platoons, the Commonwealth's special forces units. As small units of the regular military he did not need the approval of Congress to send them. They would go north as military advisors and trainers. In this role they would be free to travel through the island and by applying precision strikes begin to turn the tide of the conflict. In a speech to Congress, he announced the move on the 13th of April. Calling the deployment of the scouts an intervention rather than an invasion, Hancock explained that the scouts would be there as military advisors to Governor Chamberlain and to train up additional local Minutemen to defend their settlements from the religious extremists. By April 18, the first squads of Minutemen scouts boarded boats headed north for what would later be known as the Far Harbor Intervention. Call on whoever you know to help you. Human time is done! This is the age of the super mutant! Together, we smash everything! 